title of our talk is Af The African Storybook in Global Perspective, Children's Literacy and Teacher Identity. And what's been so exciting about this particular project is in fact the, the, the ideas that it has generated, not only in terms of what is actually happening in the African context, but it's what is actually happening in the global context. And, and the very openness of this architecture that has been developed by the South African Institute for Distance Education enables one to use the technology in a very innovative and productive ways. So I think we're going to get a glimpse of that today. Um, as I say, a glimpse, because it's a huge project, it's very exciting, so much happening in so many places. So in a sense, um, you can certainly look at my website, you just Google Bonnie Norton with a Y, and um, you'll, there's a lot of resources over there. But um, we also have um, other, other, other resources, just here in the Community Engagement website of UBC, Faculty of Education, so it's really great to have that resource. Um, Espen actually uh, has just written a fabulous piece um, on Wikipedia, so that's available. Uh, I wrote a piece in the, uh, the newspaper, The Conversation, called Digital Stories Could Hold the Key to Multilingual Literacy for African Children, and I did that with Tessa Welch, who's the project director. And of course, all of these are open line and open access, so you can certainly Google these amongst, of course, many other presentations. Um, I just want to take you back to how we plan to organize this. Our hope really is to, for, for us to have this as a tripartite presentation. I'll be presenting for 15 minutes and then Espen will be presenting for 15 and then Liam. So we're working with different aspects of this particular project. So I'll be talking about what problem the African Storybook is trying to solve the key features of the project, and in particular, why research leadership from UBC? Because of course we are a, a long distance from, from, from African communities and uh, from the South African Institute for Distance Education. How, how did it happen that UBC has, uh, is so very active in this project? Espen will talk particularly about his work on teacher identity uh, and the research that he's doing in Uganda and Liam about the remarkable Global African Storybook Project. So, um, what, um, to begin with, what is the problem that we are trying to solve here? And you only have to go to the Education for All Global Monitoring Report, which came out in 2013 to 2014. And it's, it's, it's very simple, but also very complex. Many children in the poorest countries are not learning the basics in reading and learning more broadly. And if you look at this, I'm not going to, you can certainly, uh, you'll have access to this later, but you can have a look at this to see that 96% of children in North America stay in school till grade four and achieve minimum reading standards. So you can have a look um, at, 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 uh, at, oh, um, this actually makes a very, very strange sound. So there we have North America and Western Europe. But if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, 40% of children in Sub-Saharan Africa stay in school till grade four and achieve minimum reading standards. So uh, just to share that statistic with you is already huge, because I think you will appreciate, because you're all in early childhood education, how many children we have lost by the time they reach grade four. I mean, it, it's, it, it's a tragedy, it's a travesty. It's a travesty, uh, a global travesty. And these are the issues that we are trying to address in this particular project. So when we look at issues of mother tongue literacy, there's ample research showing that students are quicker to learn to read and acquire other academic skills when first taught in the mother tongue. They also learn a second language more quickly than those initially taught to read in an unfamiliar language. Again, this is not rocket science. Uh, and we see the work of Jim Cummins, our own Jim Cummins, a very famous Canadian scholar who really presented groundbreaking uh, research to support this work. But the issue is there are few books available in the mother tongue. That is one of the major problems facing African communities. So what the African Storybook is about is an initiative of the South African Institute for Distance Education. And what, what the Institute has done with funding, generous funding from Comet Relief, is basically to draw on advances in digital technology to make a multitude 
hundreds and now thousands of stories available, free and open access to African communities. And in fact, the website has changed significantly, hasn't it, Espen? Because it used to be, we used to have quite a complex website, interactive website for this project, and now we've simplified it precisely so that it can work on cell phones. And because cell phones are in fact ubiquitous in the African context. So what is the vision? Open access, uh, picture stories in the languages of Africa for children's literacy, enjoyment, and imagination. So on an interactive website, you can find, read, and download stories in multiple African languages, as well as English, French, and Portuguese, which are the official languages in, in, uh, in many African countries. You can also create your own story, so that's very important. You can contribute to knowledge production. You can translate or adapt uh, stories, existing stories, which is what many people are doing. And of course, you can read about our work so we have a blog uh, where we have many, many different and interesting uh, issues that arise. And of course, that is also free and open access. Um, we, when we're looking at digital stories in low resource contexts, we have to be very creative because uh, we've got to work with solar power. We've got to work with digital projectors. We, of course, work with cell phones. We work with low cost storage. We work with on-demand printing at copying centers. So whichever way we can actually reach people, we do so. Um, and, uh, and as I said, solar power is something that we find. Also, just, just in fact, to, to, to run your, your cell phone, you need to have solar power. We've been working in different countries, uh, in Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa. And interesting enough, all those countries uh, have English as official languages. But in fact, um, there are many, many languages spoken in these different countries. 40 plus in Uganda, 60 plus in Kenya, and in South Africa, there are 11 official languages. But note, all examinations are in English. In terms of stories, so in 2014, we had 120 unique stories with 649 translations in many different languages uh, in Uganda, Kenya, and South Africa. Now, because of the power of the digital, uh, we have over 500 unique stories and over 2,500 translations in over 60 African languages, as well as English, French, and Portuguese. So you can see the multiplier effect of the digital and what you can do once you have open access and people can translate and adapt stories. So, I would think you would probably agree that 500 stories should be able to develop literacy for a child in whatever language they might be uh, learning in. In terms of getting these stories, we have stories from many different sources, published stories, donated stories, stories from web, uh, web research, stories collected in pilot countries, and so forth. Um, we also have partners. So we have, for example, Prath and Books, which I know in, in, here in, in, uh, in, at UBC, we're very interested in relationships with, with uh, India and with China. And Liam's going to talk a little bit about some of the bilingual Chinese Indian <coughs> books. But um, Pratham is one of our important partners. Uh, in terms of UBC, so how was it that we actually got involved in this project? So you'll see there's a picture here of Tessa Welch, who's the project director, and I'm in fact the uh, research advisor of this project. Um, this picture was taken at a Peter Wall Institute um, conference that we held actually at Stellenbosch in South Africa in 2013. Um, the issue being that the African Storybook is interested in research, in linking up with key universities and teacher training institutions. So why UBC? Well, the issue is that really since 2003, which is now over a dec decade, we've had a very active team of researchers, particularly based in the Department of Language and Literacy Education, including Maureen Kenrick and Margaret Early that I've worked very closely with, and many graduate students who have worked with us over the years. And, and what's very exciting about the African Storybook is that Julia Tembe, for example, who is um, with a PhD uh, student with us, uh, is in fact the Uganda coordinator of the African Storybook. And she's been very instrumental in, in bringing us on board. Um, so we have a look, there we have Julia Tembe working in rural areas of the country. Um, we've got Sam and Demmer, 
who is um, the policy advisor of the African Storybook. Again, uh, very active, you know, in this in this uh, in this particular project. So, of course, we also have many research questions. And one of the questions, for example, we have is to what extent do images scaffold reading in the African storybook stories? And I know more, uh, Maureen Kendrick just brought out a great book on multimodality. So we'll put that on our reading list, Maureen. But the question is, you know, it's the connection between image, you know, and text. And how is it that kids learn to read and to make meaning? So if you just look, for example, at this one little image here, um, you could have a text that says, a long time ago, three girls went out to collect wood. When they had collected enough wood, they tied it into bundles and put it on their heads. But you know, with the image, you know, you can basically limit the text to, a long time ago, three girls went out to collect wood. And you can enter into a very interesting conversation with kids on how did they do it, um, uh, and where did they put the wood, and uh, which is, could be a very exciting conversation. And it's from Nazi Bailey and the Three Hairs. Just look at bilingual mean, meaning making here, a book on, called The Children of Wax. So you can have in these texts, you know, you could have two languages. In fact, you can have two, three, or four languages. And in fact, some of the stories uh, on the African storybook have about 16 different versions. Not so, Esmond. 20 plus. 20 plus different versions of the same story in many, many different languages. I do want to just talk briefly about the construct of reading, since you are all kind of, um, interested in, in, in literacy and in reading. And the construct of reading that we have in this particular project, if you look, for example, at the Education for All Global Monitoring Report, one quarter of those aged 15 to 24 in poor countries are unable to read a single sentence. Now, that is that is obviously very disturbing. But what is very interesting is that are unable to read a single sentence. And you do wonder, what is the construct of reading? You know, is it about, in a sense, decoding sentences? And certainly that is very important, but that's in many ways you know, a, a, a very one, 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 one um, a theory of reading, right? The decoding process, you know, the bottom-up process. But if you think of reading as meaning-making, and that, that, that the opportunity for children to claim ownership of meaning. What you really are looking at there is the identity of a reader. And if children have the sense of themselves as readers, they can engage with text from a position of power. Not in a sense, what do I need to, what do I need to understand? What, what does this word mean, right? But rather, how can I make sense of this particular text? And more importantly, this particular story. You mentioned, Ariette, you know, in a sense, what are the stories that we bring? Well, the stories are central to this, this particular project. And, and I think that is what actually gives uh, children such excitement, actually, as they, as they engage with these texts. Um, the question about teachers as well, and this, of course, we are all centrally concerned about. How do we support teachers, parents, and communities to use digital stories effectively? And how do we mediate digital stories with children? And this I'm going to turn over then to Espen, who's going to talk about our research in Uganda and, uh, and, and what remarkable work we're doing with teachers. Thanks, Espen. I will start with a quote by one of the, one of, one of the participants, a teacher. She says, when I see my name there, oh, I'll be very happy. I wanted my name to appear such that people, people come. I mean, people begin to look for me. Who is this woman who writes this story? But when they reach here, they will want to know who Monica is. <clears throat> Monica is one of 12 teachers that I worked with in, uh, in, in, a, in, in a school in Uganda. This was uh, one of the African Storybook pilot sites. It was actually the only, um, out of the uh, four pilot sites in Uganda, this was the primary school. They had some other institutions also. Um, a teacher's college, a uh, library, uh, and, and an early, early childhood uh, center of sorts. <clears throat> I spent six months in the second half of, uh, of 2000, uh, 2014 uh, working with these teachers, observing lessons and, uh, and otherwise. The questions that I'm focusing on in this presentation <coughs> uh, for my research are uh, partly about the um, teacher's use of stories, but also about uh, the identity aspect of this work. 
So I ask, uh, how, do, how do teachers use stories from the African Storybook to promote early literacy? And how did the African Storybook contribute to shifting teacher identities? This might be a familiar sight for some of you if you've spent any time in schools in Africa. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you see it from there where the teacher stands, where the you know, blackboard is kind of here. Uh, as you might see, there are not, not very many uh, storybooks or textbooks or, or much print materials at all. There's a, uh, there's a poster of sorts up here. So they, they, they have some things. They, they make their own uh, materials such as that one. Uh, but mostly they use the blackboard where they write uh, sentences and, and, uh, and words that they use to, for teaching. Uh, they have a little library also with some um, books that they occasionally use. Uh, but for uh, groups of say, uh, 80, 90 plus uh, students, often, uh, the, well, almost no, no case do they have enough books for everyone. And, and uh, some books are dated. It's, 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 it's rather limited. In, in many cases. And this is, uh, <clears throat> as, as Bonnie was talking about, this is the kind of situation, or th should I say, this is the context in which African Storybook comes in and say, says, you know, how can we, you know, enrich, <clears throat> how can we contribute to, uh, you know, bringing in more literacy uh, or uh, literacy materials in, into these classrooms, into these uh, schools, uh, working with teachers. Some of the, some of the new, uh, new identity positions I identified through, uh, through my work uh, you know, and, and, um, through the African Storybook, are uh, or include the teacher as a writer, as a poet, as you might recognize from the opening quote that I will return to. Uh, but also the teacher as a digital educator, someone who actually <clears throat> goes from not having any digital skills or, or no experience with computers or no background at all to actually being relatively adept and being able to use this, much like I'm doing it now, which is which is also what the teachers would do. They would project in this manner. But also a uh, teacher as collaborator, how they. Uh, developed as, as collaborators and built on, on, on practices of collaborating. And finally, the teacher is a cha uh, change, change agent, again facilitated through the, uh, the stories and through the African Storybook project. I will start with, the, with this story. <clears throat> this is, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the teacher in the opening quote uh, talked about becoming a poet through this project. Let me just read this short uh, poem with you first. <clears throat> Mosquito, mosquito, you are a weak insect that can be blown by the moving wind. You suck our blood, transmitting malaria parasites into our bloodstreams, making our bodies painful and weak, killing us everywhere in hospitals and homes. You weak thing, leave us alone. Why don't you suck juice from plants as other insects do? You have frustrated the government's efforts. You attack us during our study times before we go to bed. This, uh, this poem, which is in, should I say, in, in, written in a style that is, um, or, or uh, written in, within the, uh, a style typical of the oral, oral story call, uh, storytelling and, and, and poetry uh, culture of this, uh, you know, this, this community that she, she's part of her. her um, uh, this is a story she wrote uh, and, and, and submitted to the African Storybook because they're, they're, they requested stories and, and other, you know, Poems. I don't think they even mentioned that, but you know, she she brought this, and and in the process, she also, uh, as she said, you know, she, you know, she becomes she becomes a poet. I, she says, uh, I've become a poet now, because <clears throat> the poem goes from just being something she's written, something she has, you know, in her own notebook, or maybe something she might teach to the pupils, but just to be something that's out there, is online. She becomes she's published essentially. She's become a writer <clears throat> or a poet. <clears throat> what is what is uh, unique about the African uh, storybook? What is special about it is that you know she might have she might have very well have told this story before, but now she has an avenue for publishing, and she's also uh, um, her her um, her abilities and her um, uh, you know her her you know writing abilities are acknowledged, and her authorship is acknowledged through this process. You know, it takes on a new, a new meaning and it become, becomes bigger than just a story or just teaching it to, to one or two classes. Uh, this is uh, a teacher, much like I'm doing now, she's teaching a story like I'm giving a presentation. She's uh, <clears throat> using the digital tools, as you can see down here, uh, well, you can barely see, but this is a projector, it's a bit dark, it's, it's about this, uh, this big, and then a laptop, much like I'm doing here, which uh, she got through the uh, African Storybook. So she's projecting it onto, in this case, a portable screen, 
Uh, they, they use the behind the screen you see like the, the, this white bed sheet that's what they used for the first uh, four or five months or so and then they later on they got the, the portable screen what is also interesting is that you see she's using the blackboard which is the you know, conventional way of teaching you know that she writes words and, and phrases on the blackboard in this case she's actually using both so she's writing some words from the, um, the theme of this of this week and she's also using this so she can inter she integrates the two modes at the same time and she has a, a little pointer in her hand she uses to point to individual words, she says, I cut the butternut, it says there. So she'll point to individual words, people should repeat, or she'll ask people to come up and point to words. So she integrates the two modes, and, and she does this, uh, in this case, she also brings in the digital into this process. Uh, as I think I briefly mentioned, the teachers had no experience at all with computers. They'd not been online. Uh, they, many of them said they feared to touch a computer. They were worried they would break something, or you know, they, they had never done it before, quite simply. In the process of these, you know, these few months, they got, a, they got a little bit of training initially, but not very much, a few sessions. Uh, and when I came, they, they were still quite uh, you know, uncertain about it. In the process, some of them developed uh, skills and were quite, uh, quite adept by the end. Others, not so much. They, but in the end, they ended up, um, or they, they, they relied on each other to actually you know, to make this happen. You know, so, so some teachers taught other teachers, and, and in the process, also learned that, you know, you, you learn more by teaching others, as, as, as also one of the teachers uh, expressed herself. And, and uh, these, this, this um, practice of collaboration is, of course, nothing new. They, they did that before the project. In, in, in fact, they, um, they had a fairly established practice of especially planning together and also asking each other questions. So, so this built on existing practice, but also took it further by, you know, developing digital skills and also, you know, using these in... Um, in the classroom to teach. Uh, this, uh, this is a story on this uh, soccer star. Uh, I will use the story as an example of how uh, one of the teachers acted as a, as a change agent in, um, or with, with, her, with her pupils. And this one watched the uh, boys play soccer. She wished that she could join them. She asked the coach if she can practice with them. The coach puts, put, uh, put his hands on his hips. At this school, only boys are allowed to play soccer, he said. The boys told her to go play netball. They said that netball is for girls and soccer is for boys. And this was upset. The next day, the school had a big soccer match. The coach was worried because, because his blessed, best player was sick and could not play. And this ran to the coach and begged him to let her play. The coach was not sure what to do. Then he decided that Andiswa could join the team. The game was tough. Nobody had scored a goal by halftime. During the second half of the match, one of the boys passed the ball to Andiswa. She moved very fast forward to the goal post. She kicked the ball hard and scored a goal. The crowd went wild with joy. Since that day, girls were also allowed to play soccer at the school. Sorry. What is interesting about this story, apart from being an awesome story in its own right, is how the teacher actually used this to, uh, to discuss the gender roles of, uh, of sports at her school. So she was also a physical education teacher, and she was kind of concerned that her, well, much like the boys in the story, her own pupils, who's grade three, uh, you know, had similar attitudes and you know, didn't want to play with the, with the, boy, with the girls, even, even though the teacher actually you know, told them to, right? Um, and so they read this story together, and they started talking about, you know, can, can girls play, uh, play football also? And, you know, she kind of got the, got the boys along, and, and you know, as she put it, it really changed the attitudes of the boys. What's also important is, uh, uh, you know, in, in the process, I mean, she, the, the boys of the attitude, uh, sorry, the attitudes of the boys may have changed in the process. But, but for her as a teacher, it also meant that she well, partly had a, you know, a tool, if you like, or a... Uh, or a means to actually bring this conversation up to the classroom and, and not just on a theoretical level, but actually use this as, as, a, as a good example of that and you know, open that as a conversation. So in, in the process, it also meant that she could negotiate her role as a teacher, uh, as, as a change agent who could you know, bring questions of general roles um, into the classroom and, and actually you know, make, connect, connect the classroom and the, and, and the courtyard and the schoolyard. Uh, you know, all, all of these, um, uh, you know, uses an example may, may seem very, uh, 
you know, very nice, and, and there are many, many good examples. But at the same time, it's important to, to remember the conditions these teachers are working in. And as you saw, the opening uh, photograph of the classroom, I mean, the, the physical conditions and other, you know, salaries are a number of, you know, constraints and concerns. But I'll just focus on, uh, on some of these kind of broader issues. Uh, one being the curriculum, uh, which in a sense is very supportive, supportive of, uh, of teaching stories. But in practice, it's, uh, it's also quite loaded and has certain themes that the teachers feel compelled to follow. They, they have to, uh, there will be a theme called uh, Things We Make, there will be a uh, theme called uh, Peace in Our Community, and they're, they're expected to follow these themes in, in how, how they teach, uh, which was a major factor in limiting teachers because many felt that they oh, we have to find a story that matches this theme, some more than others. Uh, but that was uh, certainly a, a factor in which effectively, is, and for some teachers, limited the amount of, uh, of uh, stories they did taught. Another aspect, uh, another aspect which I have represented here with a photograph of, uh, of a lesson plan, one of the teachers. The, um, so they, they write these, um, they plan their lessons, they write uh, what they're going to do and, and uh, uh, you know, what they will do, the methods, the oh, structures all over here. A number of things how they will actually teach the lesson. And this is this is also uh, taken from the curriculum. They, they, they look up things. Okay, this week it's about uh, you know certain topics, so they'll copy that over. Uh, it takes a lot of time, um, and in, in this process, there's not much room for these stories. There's no and this was soccer star is not in there, right? There's no mention. There's no reference to. I'm sure you will find gender somewhere, but it's not like you can just oh, look up a page and you'll find that. It's not matched in any way. So it you know, takes quite a bit of imagination and creativity for the teachers to kind of make that connection or, or somehow you know, do it anyway. The teachers, um, a, a, another aspect, so this um, lesson plan and, and, and similar uh, preparations that they had to make were also something that they were, um, they, they were supervised based on this. They had to show it to the, to the school leadership as well as um, uh, as well as external uh, exter external supervisors who would come and actually check all of these documents and make sure that everything was in place. Uh, so together, these these uh, largely rest uh, restricted and constrained the um, the using of stories. So in conclusion, the the African storybook and their stories brought about uh, new and innovative ways of teaching. Uh, as as we've seen perhaps best exemplified by the Niso Soccer Star, but also other um, uh, other stories in other other ways. It also brought about some new identity positions uh, that the teachers could teach from. They could take on um, new um, new positions, such as uh, uh, again, such as the, and this was a good a good example of. At the same time, they were still working within a number of. Uh, there were a number of uh, circumstances and, and uh, factors that uh, often limited and sometimes maybe also facilitated uh, the teaching of stories, um, in, including exams and, uh, and other aspects which I haven't really gotten into here. But uh, the curriculum was a major, major factor, but also other, uh, other practices. Uh, this is the blog <laughs> that's that Bonnie was looking for. <laughs> little bit of shifting uh, last minute here. Um, so I, we invite you to go to the blog, uh, the African Storybook blog, uh, where you can read more about this and, and, and also contribute if you have, uh, um, you know, some, some thoughts, to sh thoughts to share. So uh, on that note, I would like to, uh, to thank you all and, and um, my funders for this research. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk about the African Storybook Project, um, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I remember the first time I heard about the African Storybook Project. Uh, Bonnie was giving a talk much like this one, and she explained all about how unique the, the project was, both in terms of its scope, in terms of uh, its openness, its multilingualism, the fact that it was a project by Africans, for Africans. I heard about this, I was just thrilled. Um, I wanted to tell everybody about this. I wanted everybody to know. And I kind of haven't really turned back since then. So uh, this is... <laughs> This is where I'm coming from. I, I, just to make it clear, I think that everyone in the world should know about this project and the stories that, that uh, we've seen here. I, I really do. I think these should be on the curriculum in every school, in every country, in the world. I think that every child should have access to and should be able to read these stories and hear these stories in their first language. I think that parents around the world who read to their children 
should consider reaching for an African story rather than Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I think, in, in other words, that we should share these stories with the world. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is a project, just a little small project that aims to do just that. Appropriately enough, it's called the Global African Storybook Project, because again, we want to share these stories with the world. So the scope of the original African Storybook Project um, was really clear and ambitious. Uh, it, and it covers translations into uh, any African language. So if you know anything about uh, the languages on the continent, you realize that's a huge task. The scope of the Global African Storybook Project is also ambitious. <laughs> it, and we accept translations into any non-African language. And we particularly uh, encourage uh, translations into marginalized languages and minority languages, languages where there aren't a lot of resources um, at all um, uh, if, uh, other than, than this. So I want to sort of stress that this is a grassroots initiative uh, run entirely by volunteers, uh, but because we're, we're le leveraging uh, open data, we've managed in a very few short months to uh, see enormous growth. Uh, we've uh, got right now, at the moment, uh, 201 translations in 19 different languages. We have uh, prototyped uh, software that allows us to, tra to translate stories quickly and easily um, using your cell phone, uh, uh, you know, a, a tablet, or your computer, whatever you want, uh, uh, in a matter of uh, seconds or minutes. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, efficient process. All of this is only possible because of this little <laughs> blurb, this small notice, that you'll find on the, uh, on the bottom of the African Storybook website, uh, which basically releases all of the content under a Creative Commons license. Now, if you're not familiar with the Creative Commons uh, attribution license, what it means in a nutshell is you're free to use the stories in whatever way you want, so long as you give credit to the original authors when you do so. So. Using this, we, we've been able to facilitate the, and coordinate the translating of stories into multiple different languages without having to worry about such things as asking for permission every time we want to make a translation. But the thing with the, the, uh, an open license like this is it, it doesn't really stop there. Uh, apart from being able to facilitate our translations, it also allows us to do other things, to repurpose the stories in ways that the original authors could never have imagined or anticipated. So before we did that, we had to liberate the, the stories from their PDF format that they were in, which is lovely looking, it's beautiful to, look, to read, but not very convenient uh, to edit, change, manipulate, or otherwise adapt. So without going into too many details, what we did was we wrote a small uh, program that allowed us to extract all of the text and all of the images from all of the stories in all of the languages on the African Storybook website. I don't know if you remember, there are 60 plus, now 70 languages on that site. So this was just to facilitate our translations. We, we ended up with a giant big data, uh, database, a series of databases, um, one containing text, one containing images, all linked together with metadata, um, and it just made it a lot easier for us. When we wanted to translate a story, we didn't have to fiddle around with PDFs, we just translated that text, and then we had another little program that stitched all the text back together with the corresponding images. You just press a button and boom, you have a PDF, an ebook, a slideshow, any number of other different formats. So that was just to make our lives easier. We ended up with these kinds of nice looking documents in, in like I said, multiple different formats and multiple languages. But what we also had was the side effect where we had these giant big um, databases that we put online for other people to use under the same license, uh, the same Creative Commons license, so other people could repurpose these uh, for their own use. But we had, first of all, a big huge database of text, which was really a giant corpus, a giant multilingual parallel corpus in 60 plus African languages. Now, I don't know if, you, if, if anybody is interested in corpus linguistics, this is a huge deal. So what it means is that for most of these languages, this is the largest, if not the only corpus of its kind anywhere, let alone under an open license. This was just a, a byproduct of, of the fact that we wanted to make it easy to, to translate things. So we built a few tools to, to help people repurpose that data, and we also repurposed it ourselves. Um, 
but the other database that we had was this great big collection of images, 4,000 plus children's story images from the, um, the African Storybook Image um, Bank that were just, uh, they're, they were, again, sort of unique. Um, there's no such thing anywhere, really, uh, that, where you can just download thousands of uh, often professionally uh, done images, some of them done by children. They're, they're full color um, and, and just wonder, it's a wonderful collection. On the other hand, it was just sort of sitting there in a folder on, online. And we thought it would be great if we could sort of explore it. We could look through those images and use them, find them with keywords maybe. And we thought about a, a bunch of different ways to do that. We thought about, uh, briefly, uh, we thought about hand tagging the images. Maybe we could have a bunch of volunteers just write down, go through each image and write down, you know, this is a picture of a tree, this is a picture of a, an elephant. And, and we quickly abandoned that idea. But then it suddenly occurred to us that we already have a linked database that tells us all the text associated with each image in the collection. In other words, the, image, uh, the text on the page that the image came from. Now, if we work with the assumption that in a storybook, the il an illustration, a picture, illustrates the text on the page that it's, it's on, which I think is a fair assumption, we could see that text as keywords. So we thought, well, let's, let's just see how this works. So we filtered the text of all the English stories through, um, uh, through a filter that, that, uh, of, of stop words that basically took out all the words like the and of, uh, you know, all these common words that we didn't want uh, in the corpus to just give us a bunch of keywords. And then we uh, threw, up, threw it all up on a web page. Um, we called it the image, ASP Image Bank Explorer. We weren't sure if it would work because this was not a search engine the way that you have, um, you know, you might be used to. There's no algorithm, there's no deep neural network or something that we'd trained to tell you what people were looking for. So we weren't sure if this would work at all. We were uh, surprised to discover that it worked pretty well. Considering that there was nobody who'd actually tagged these images, except for the people who wrote the stories, when you look for libraries, you find pictures of libraries and people reading in libraries. When you look for uh, lions or elephants or cats or dogs, uh, you just see pictures of lions, elephants, and cats and dogs. I, I thought that was amazing because I didn't expect it to work at all. We could have stopped there, but then we realized what's really special about this corpus, again, is it's a multilingual parallel corpus in 60 plus African languages. So there's nothing stopping us from doing the same thing in all of those languages. Again, we didn't know if this would work because I don't think anybody's done this before, but we thought, well, let's, let's try it out. And what we, what we ended up with was the same uh, Image Bank Explorer available in all 62 languages, plus all the 19 languages we translated um, uh, in the Global ASP project. So if you search in Lunyole for uh, crocodiles, you get pictures of crocodiles. If you search in uh, Swahili for pictures of cows, you get pictures of cows. Uh, if you search in Chinese for pictures of li lions, you get lions. Um, I, I still find this amazing because uh, no work was done to set up an algorithm. This really shouldn't be the, all that accurate at all. So going back to that corpus, I can't stress enough, this is a parallel corpus in multiple languages um, that doesn't really have, there's nothing really, really like it out there. Um, what you can do with it um, is to create lots of bilingual stories. Now what we've been doing with bilingual stories prior to this is making them by hand. This is a perfect example of something that human beings are not very good at and computers are excellent at. In other words, to make a bilingual story, you sort of copy and paste text from this page in this language, and then you get the text in the other language, and you kind of, you do it yourself and paste them together. And this is a long, arduous, uh, not very fun process. On the other hand, we have this database. And as far as the computer is concerned, to make a bilingual story, you point at language A and you point at language B and you press a button saying, I want a story. So we were able to make bilingual stories in any combination that we wanted. So here's our Hindi-English collection. A lot of times we make bilingual stories in kind of the most popular languages. Um, we think, well, people might find Hindi-English stories interesting, and that's not really unusual. But what is unusual about this is I just said that we could make this in any combination uh, that you want. Literally any combination of all the 70 plus languages that we had, uh, which is, I can't do math uh, in my head, but that's, <laughs> that's a lot of different combinations. Um, and again, for people to do that, that takes a long time. But for the computer, the computer does not care if you make one set of uh, bilingual translations or if you make a thousand. It can do, it can do uh, either of those uh, just as easily. So here's our Hindi Chinese collection, just because we can. And the other thing is that we also don't know in the future who will need what bilingual translation. We have no way of predicting 
down the road, what language somebody might be studying, what language somebody might speak as their first language, all, all of these things, the L1s and L2s, are completely out of, um, uh, out of our knowledge. So what we did was we just told the computer to make every combination possible of all those languages. Let that sink in. So here we have, nobody's asked us for a Chinese to Swahili uh, version of these stories, but here we have a collection of, uh, if I can read here, something like 1824 uh, different uh, Swahili Chinese um, um, books. They're beautiful books, and if anyone in China is studying Swahili down the road, they're in luck. If anyone in Kenya is studying Chinese, they're in luck. We don't know if that will happen, but it costs us nothing. There's no marginal cost to making these. So the other thing, if you just think back to, remember when we were making the image bank and we, we extracted a whole bunch of keywords to make it easier for us to find images? Well, it turns out that those keywords are actually pretty useful on their own. Just as keywords, it's a list of keywords for every story is not too shabby, actually. So, if, so what we did was we started to um, uh, just generate these word lists, the sort of thing you might see in a graded reader. So for every story in the collection, in every language, we have word lists now that tell you what the unusual words, the keywords, in other words, for that, uh, for that story are. So we have them in Swahili, obviously, but because it's a multilingual, we can have them for any language. We have them in French because we've got 100 plus stories in French that uh, have been translated, some by people uh, right here in the Department of Language and Literacy Education. So we have them in a whole bunch of different languages, um, and, and we found them really useful. Another thing you can do with a parallel corpus is make dictionaries. Now, if you had a really fine-grained corpus, uh, you could do things like uh, you know, match them at the word level. We don't have a corpus that's fine-grained enough to match words at the word level. We do, however, have a corpus that's aligned very nicely at the sentence and paragraph level. And what that means is that we can create something that may, in fact, be even more useful, which is example sentence dictionaries. So dictionaries of example sentences, the words being used in context. To give you an idea of how that works, you, you're reading a story, you come across a word you don't know, you look it up in the dictionary, you get a whole list of how that word is used throughout the rest of the corpus of stories. So there's all sorts of um, uh, things with uh, rabbits and foxes being cunning. If you don't know what the word cunning means, you look it up and you, you can see them all in context. And again, we have this for every possible language combination because they're aligned uh, in, this, uh, in this database across languages. This is Norwegian to Lugbarati. And if you think nobody could ever need a Norwegian to Lugbarati dictionary, you need to speak to Espen <laughs> because uh, he is a Norwegian speaker um, who is also learning Lugbarati. So our latest uh, project has been to uh, make audio storybooks. We've been recording audio of the stories being read aloud in different languages. This is something Espen started out. Uh, he made a fan, a fantastic, he did fantastic work making audio uh, recordings of people reading uh, the stories in various um, uh, Ugandan languages. Uh, and so we had these, uh, these audio tracks. And what we did was we used uh, software to split the tracks at the pauses. So whenever there's a silence, that means you're, you're pausing between pages. We had it cut, so we now have the audio separated into tracks representing one page each. And what that means is we can make uh, uh, really nice uh, audio storybooks, which are, it's, it's better for me to just uh, demonstrate rather than try to explain. So these are controllable. In other words, I can go backwards, I can go forwards, I can skip around the story, and it's, it's like having somebody read this to you um, as many times as you want, um, except that you can make them go back and forth and, and have it completely under your control. If you've ever learned a language, you know that it's really important to not just have, um, have uh, text to read, but also be able to, to hear the language being used. So we found this to be incredibly useful um, to us, and we wanted to, to see it happen with more stories. So, like I said, we've been doing just that. So we've been started recording these in multiple different languages. This is an ongoing project. This is a story uh, recorded in uh, Norwegian. It's the same thing. If you're learning Norwegian, this is, a, this is just a fantastic thing to have. This means that I don't need to ask Espen to read me this story a hundred times <laughs> over in order to hear the, the, the vagaries of the distinctions between uh, individual words. So finally, I don't know if there's any time, but most recently we've uh, taken these tools and 
uh, generalize them again because we, we made them with the understanding that they could be repurposed. And so we've started repurposing them already. And we've heard already about Pratham Books, which is another amazing initiative uh, with Indian stories and Indian languages. Uh, and we were able to point all of these tools at the Pratham Books collection and instantly get an image bank explorer, a translator, uh, a corpus of data in Indian languages. It's, uh, it's the same thing except uh, multiplied. So uh, that's what I think of that is, is the, the benefit of using open data, the benefit of using open tools, and the benefit of, of designing them from the ground up with the understanding that other people might want to repurpose them down the road. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Esmond and Liam. I mean, I think you, I think you, it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Just like it blows, blows the mind. The thing that I find so interesting about working with Liam and Espen is, is that you see the potential. You know, I saw the potential of this project, of course, you know, a number of years ago. But to see it being actualized, that's the thing that blows my mind. Because you, you can see the open access, you can see you could do things if only somebody did it. Well, <coughs> people are doing it, you know. And I have to tell you that Liam says, you know, we are doing this and we are doing that. Believe me. That I am doing this. I am doing that with a little, little bit of help from from Espen and maybe other people. So a lot of help, maybe. But uh, so so. And in fact, you know, I was in China recently. I went to, in China. I was in China in December, and I showed them. I actually showed them the work that Liam was doing, and people were unbelievably excited and were interested in collaboration. Where do we go from here? In fact, when I was in India, I did the same. I was in India recently. Showed them all the stories. There was huge excitement. But what I think is possibly one of the most amazing things about the global ASP, for example, is you can go from Hindi to Chinese, not necessarily English. You know? So talk about democratizing you know, the language education you know, and uh, giving people a sense of ownership. Right? That the, the world is not necessarily Anglo-centric. A lot of it is, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And you have this kind of model that allows you to actually, you know, work with language in, in very hybrid ways. So, um, such a pleasure. Thank you, Molly and Aspen and Liam. Honestly, inspirational. Honestly, just absolutely.